Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Pam and I'll be your host. Um, just to make sure you're in the right place, you should be here for the panel discussion. We're 254 Pediatric Thyroid Cancer Session 2. Um, children are not just small adults. An update on pediatric thyroid cancer and recurrent and persistent thyroid cancer, a surgeon's perspective. And also um, we have another session um, that talks about um, care in the community. What information do you need to know to try to optimize care for your child, as well as being a knowledgeable advocate for the next pediatric patient? So both excellent sessions. I'm very excited and pleased to introduce um, both of our speakers today. Um, first, Dr. Peter Angelos, um, he'll be the first one speaking. Um, he is the Linda Kohler Anderson Professor of Surgery and Surgical Ethics, Chief of Endocrine Surgery and Associate Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. He completed his undergraduate degree, medical school, and a PhD in philosophy at Boston University. He completed his residency in general surgery at Northwestern University and went on to complete fellowships in clinical ethics at the University of Chicago and in endocrine surgery at the University of Michigan. Dr. Angelos has written widely on improving outcomes of thyroid cancer and parathyroid surgery minimally invasive endocrine surgery, and ethical aspects in the care of surgical patients. Dr. Angelos is a FICA medical advisor. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Dr. Andrew Bauer. He is a pediatric endocrinologist and the director of the Thyroid Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, or CHOP. Dr. Bauer retired from the United States Army after 29 years of service to include two combat tours in Iraq. His clinical and research interests are focused on the study of pediatric thyroid disorders, including hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, thyroid nodular disease, thyroid cancer, and familiar thyroid tumor syndromes. Dr. Bauer serves as co-chair of the American Thyroid Association's Pediatric Thyroid Cancer Guidelines and as a member of the ATA's Board of Directors. In 2018, Dr. Bauer served on the World Health Organization International Agency for Research on Cancer Expert Group that published guidelines on thyroid screening after nuclear disasters. He has spoken at many FICA events. Dr. Bauer is a FICA medical advisor. So I'm very excited to have both of you today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the nice introduction and <clears throat> I'm up first uh, and I, I have uh, promised Dr. Bauer that I won't take up uh, more than my allotted time so that he'll have plenty of time to go through his uh, important topic. Um, so as you heard from the introduction, um, I'm a surgeon and so I'm gonna just go through a few things that I think are relevant from the surgical point of view when it comes to um, the treatment of thyroid cancer in uh, children and in adolescents. Um, so the title, uh, children are not just small adults, um, is based on this idea that um, things are different in the pediatric population and that it's not just that um, the thyroid's smaller. Um, I'm gonna emphasize uh, well-differentiated thyroid cancer, primarily papillary thyroid cancer, because that is the most common, um, but many of the issues will be relevant as well to other types, such as medullary thyroid cancer. Um, and uh, in the introduction, you heard that Dr. Bauer is the um, co-chair of the American Thyroid Association Pediatric Thyroid Cancer Guidelines. Um, I was on the prior guidelines group with uh, Dr. Bauer, um, the new guidelines, he is uh, on that uh, working group and uh, I am not on the current. Um, and those new guidelines are yet to be published. So he may share some thoughts about that, um, but I'll be speaking primarily based on um, the prior set of guidelines. Now, as I said, this, this notion that children are not just small adults is that there are differences between children and adults when it comes to the pathology and pathophysiology of thyroid cancer. Um, the biology of the tumors in children is different. Um, and there are a number of things that are different. Um, among the most important is that uh, 
the prognosis is really outstanding and probably the best for children in comparison to adults, um, especially with respect to papillary thyroid cancer. And I'll highlight a few additional differences in the next few minutes. So in terms of the basics of papillary thyroid cancer in children and adolescents, um, thyroid cancer represents a small percentage of all pediatric malignancies. Um, the incidence appears to be increasing among 15 to 19 year olds. Um, it is the second most common cancer among girls. Uh, and in adolescents, there's a tenfold greater incidence than in younger children. So in, in the very young uh, child, it's much less common. And again, we're not sure about all of the reasons why the incidence is increasing, but this is um, similar to the increasing incidence in adults over the last um, few decades. So um, some important issues with respect to um, adolescent patients, um, the female to male preponderance is about five to one. In the very young ages, it's much closer to one to one. Um, in the pediatric population, the most common presentation of thyroid cancer and especially papillary thyroid cancer is a palpable cervical lymph node. Now, children much more frequently have more lymph nodes with cancer in them than do adults. Um, now, the important thing to know is that this does not change the overall excellent prognosis, even when there are um, many nodes that have cancer in them. Occasionally, we'll see, especially young, very young children with a diffusely enlarged thyroid gland and sort of a diffuse um, thyroid cancer as opposed to in specific nodules. Um, but again, even that group has a very good prognosis. So uh, this is sort of the overall theme. Children and adolescents have the best prognosis, um, but surgical management is really essential to these good outcomes. And so I'll just mention a few things about that uh, in a minute. Um, without question, the multidisciplinary approach to the treatment of thyroid cancers in children is critical. So surgery is essential. We need the input of our endocrinologists. Genetic counseling is often encouraged. Um, and um, you know, we really do need the input of our colleagues um, in uh, sometimes in radiology, um, certainly in pathology as well. So when it comes to optimal surgery, in most circumstances in children, we do a total thyroidectomy or a near total thyroidectomy. Now, this is certainly an area that's gradually changing, um, but in general, um, in the pediatric age group, there's been much more tendency to recommend taking out the whole thyroid gland as opposed to just a lobectomy, either one side or the other. Um, and the difference between a total and a near total thyroidectomy is a semantic difference. It's just terminology. It's essentially to remove as much of the thyroid gland as the surgeon safely can. We know that every time a surgeon says, I've done a total thyroidectomy, it's technically actually a near total thyroidectomy because there's almost always some small amount of residual thyroid tissue left in the neck. We generally recommend removing central compartment lymph nodes. So those are the lymph nodes that are close to the trachea between the carotid and carotid. So that includes where the thyroid sits in the neck. Um, we generally recommend removal of central compartment lymph nodes at the time of the original operation, unless we're dealing with a very small thyroid cancer. And the reason for this is papillary thyroid cancer in children very commonly involves lymph nodes and first in the central compartment. Sometimes we'll also do what's known as a lateral neck dissection. So that's removing lymph nodes from further away from the trachea. 
Um, but we generally don't want to remove lymph nodes from the lateral neck unless we have documentation that there's actually cancer there. Um, and so, so we generally are not doing prophylactic lateral neck dissections. That's just removing lymph node just because we think there might be cancer, but rather we want to have proven that there is cancer before we, we remove those lymph nodes. Now, um, here's uh, uh, an anatomy picture just to sort of remind everyone, um, this is what the thyroid looks like. It's sort of a butterfly shape. Sometimes there's a part going straight up, that's the pyramidal lobe. And close by are lymph nodes in the central compartment. Um, there's a nerve on either side that we worry about. Uh, and all of these are important structures. When it comes to the risks of surgery, we know that there is a risk of permanent hoarseness from a injury of either of the recurrent laryngeal nerves that sits just behind the thyroid, um, one on each side. Um, we know that patients can have a permanently low calcium level after surgery if the parathyroid glands were all injured. Now, there are four parathyroid glands, two on each side. If all four of them are injured or removed, then the calcium levels will be very low and it's necessary to treat that with extra calcium, sometimes extra vitamin D to help absorb the calcium. And these are, these are risks, the risk of a low calcium and the risk of nerve injury. These are both things that we in surgery are doing our very best to minimize those risks. We know, um, and here's, here's a, a view of the recurrent laryngeal nerves, one on each side, there's also what's called the superior laryngeal nerve um, and the little parathyroid glands, one on each side. So we know that the risks of permanently low calcium from parathyroid gland injury, that's only about a 1% risk. And similarly, the risks of a recurrent laryngeal nerve injury being permanent is also about a 1% risk. So some of the important surgical considerations, um, well, despite the fact that there's an excellent overall prognosis, because it is much more common in children than in adults that they will have extensive involvement of lymph nodes, we often need to do a more extensive operation. And the risks to the parathyroid glands are significant because of that need to frequently remove lymph nodes from the central compartment, that central neck dissection, because that's the most common place for lymph nodes to be uh, enlarged. And that's also where the parathyroids and the blood supply to the parathyroids are located. Now, we really cannot depend on radioactive iodine to ablate any significant amount of cancer cells in lymph nodes. So radioactive iodine is effective, um, but not everybody gets radioactive iodine. And if a lymph node is um, involved with cancer and is big enough to look abnormal, either visually or on ultrasound, then those lymph nodes often will not uh, be ablated or we can't get rid of them with radioactive iodine, that's where surgery is important. So um, central neck dissection, I mentioned um, in uh, pediatric patients, um, this should be uh, comprehensive. So it's not, the idea isn't to do what, what surgeons refer to as berry picking. So berry picking is where you find an abnormal node and you take it out and then you find another node and you take it out. The whole idea is to remove sort of the whole packet of lymph nodes from an area, either in the central neck or in the lateral neck. Um, now, uh, this issue, should you do a central node dissection even when there are no abnormal lymph nodes? Um, well, this is where there's likely gonna be uh, more variability in the years to come. But traditionally we've said, unless it's a very small papillary thyroid cancer, it is important for the surgeon to remove central compartment lymph nodes. Now we know that 
when it comes to safe thyroid surgery, especially in children, um, it's important to have an experienced and high volume surgeon. Um, the ATA guidelines have um, stated that a high volume surgeon is one who does 30 or more thyroidectomies for cancer in a year. Um, and so, so there, there certainly is data to show that there's lower risk with high volume surgeons. And so that is something that is often a, an important thing to assess um, is your surgeon someone who does this on a regular basis? Um, again, it's critical to avoid complications because we don't want to make the treatment worse than the disease. So we know that children with papillary thyroid cancer especially live um, essentially normal life expectancy. So we don't want them to have a complication that they're going to have for their whole lives. So we wanna be sure that the treatment isn't worse than the disease. Um, so again, that's based on the fact that we expect a pretty essentially normal life expectancy. Now, when it comes to recurrent thyroid cancer, we think about local recurrence, so that's in the thyroid bed, as opposed to nodal recurrence or distant um, distance spread, which is much less common. Uh, when it comes to um, recurrence of thyroid cancer, we generally want to talk about whether it's biochemical evidence of recurrence or structural evidence of recurrence. So biochemical recurrence is based on tumor markers. Um, if they're previously low and now they're rising, that would suggest that there's a recurrence of cancer. So most commonly that's thyroglobulin levels for papillary and follicular thyroid cancers. Um, and those are, thyroglobulin can readily be followed if someone's had a total thyroidectomy, um, not if they've only had a lobectomy. Um, and thyroglobulin is not a useful tumor marker um, when you've got significant thyroid tissue. Um, in the case of medullary thyroid cancer, the most common tumor marker we use is calcitonin. So again, we want to think about where is the recurrence. So is the recurrence in the central neck close to the trachea, uh, where the thyroid normally sits, or is it in the lateral neck on either side? So um, these are all areas where it's common to have recurrence of lymph nodes. Um, so when it comes to structural recurrence, um, we do want to be sure that we can identify the tumor on imaging. Um, most commonly that's with ultrasound in the neck. Um, once we have a suspicious lymph node or a nodule, and we need to prove it's cancer with a biopsy. So usually this is an ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration or FNA. If we cannot find it to biopsy it, then it's not a good idea for a surgeon to try to surgically remove it um, because we may not be able to find it in the operating room. So again, we want to be sure that we don't make the treatment worse than the disease. So we want to ensure that we're avoiding complications we want to know where is the recurrence? Is it in the central neck where the nerves and the parathyroid glands are going to potentially be at risk? Or is it in the lateral neck where if it's very high, there may be a greater risk for a nerve injury that affects movement of the arm. If it's very low, especially on the left side, um, there may be a risk of a lymphatic leak and therefore a need for a drain after surgery. Um, again, you've seen this diagram, so I don't need to review that anatomy. Some of the surgical considerations, despite the excellent prognosis, we need to be sure that um, the surgery is done optimally the best first time so that reoperations are less likely, because with reoperations, there are higher risks. Um, it's critical, in my opinion, to have a preoperative discussion with an endocrinologist about sort of what the surgical plan is and ensure that there's an agreement. Um, and really we shouldn't depend on radioactive iodine to just ablate gross cancer. Gross cancer means cancer that's big enough to see on an ultrasound or feel. And if you can find it on an ultrasound, you can usually biopsy it and then you can surgically remove it. 
So a couple more things about reoperation, confirm the diagnosis whenever possible. We always want to review outside slides if the patient's prior surgery was elsewhere. We want to obtain the prior operative and pathology reports. Preoperative laryngoscopy is a test to make sure the vocal cords are both moving, and that's critical when we're going back. And again, we've got to weigh the risks of surgery against the possibility for progression. So generally, we want to remove those surg surgically abnormal nodes. Rarely is radioactive iodine effective in ablating grossly abnormal lymph nodes. Percutaneous ethanol ablation is sometimes done much more commonly in adults in the lateral neck. Um, external beam radiation, not generally initial treatment, and so isn't something we generally do unless it's a very extensive situation. High frequency ultrasound and radio frequency ablation, I would say at this point should be considered experimental. Um, so we do need adequate imaging. Usually that's ultrasound, sometimes CT scan is necessary, and a PET CT maybe we'll use in a few situations. Um, when it comes to reoperative surgery, the central neck, there are the bigger risks of the parathyroids and the nerves. Um, we need to determine whether a central neck should be explored on just one side or both sides. Um, we've got to consider that maybe a recurrent laryngeal nerve may be involved. Sometimes we even have to sacrifice a nerve, but that's not common. Um, and usually we use nerve monitoring um, to try to minimize the risks as much as possible. Um, if there's lateral nodal disease and the central compartment lymph nodes was not, were not previously removed, we take those out. Um, and generally, if there's been a prior central neck dissection, we've got to weigh the risks of whether we're going to go back in unless we have very clear evidence of disease. So we do want to balance the, uh, how extensive the operation with the need to avoid risks. We'll often use ultrasound guided injection of blue dye into lymph nodes to help identify them in the operating room. And it's really important, I think, for surgeons to avoid the suggestion that we've gotten everything out um, because we know that when patients present with positive lymph nodes, cancer in lymph nodes, the likelihood of recurrence is going to be higher down the road. So I was going to answer questions at the end, but thank you very much. And I wanted to turn over to Dr. Bauer. All right. Thank you so much, Peter. And to Pam Barb and to Gary, of course, and the attendees today. Let me bring up my slides. So when I was talking to Gary and trying to plan what topics we would cover this year. Um, we decided to put together a different talk than from previous years. And I actually found a slide set, I think from 2009 or something. It was an old slide set about quality of life um, that I kind of tuned into, tuned up to hopefully be something that would be more aligned with what the the title is, which is trying to educate and go through what a, what people in the community that may not have the same access to care for a thyroid center or tertiary care center um, should be educated on um, so that they become better advocates for themselves uh, and hopefully mentors for other people that are going through the process, other families going through the process, which I think societies and, and patient adv advocacy groups like Thyca are so critical to help us try to push you know, the healthcare system to do better for, for our patients. So just for everyone to think about as we go through this um, and hopefully maybe 15 minutes or so, and then you know, we have time for questions at the end. We also have a four o'clock session. I think Dr. Wasserman Jonathan is gonna join me as well where you can ask us questions, um, specific questions or general questions about healthcare for um, your son or daughter or family members, um, pediatric family members. So as, we, as I go through this, you know, your experiences are really helpful for us as providers, because that's how we figure out if you're having problems accessing the healthcare system and what we can do if we have a voice, you know, a seat at a table when there are discussions of what we can do as a community to improve care. So you reaching out to us is as critical and important as us trying to educate you on what the process is and that should be a continuous communication as, as we move down to help take care of um, your family members 
uh, with thyroid cancer. So how did you access the healthcare system? What was the initial evaluation like? What was the initial treatment like? And how has surveillance and continued care been as you journeyed down this road for your son or daughter or other family members? The process is pretty laid out. It's not really a recipe. Um, there are things that can be changed along the way, but it typically starts and finishes with an ultrasound going through from nodule needs a biopsy. If the biopsy is positive, do you need surgery? Can you do surveillance? Then medical therapy, and then the process starts all over again. And the, the intensity of the surveillance um, and then the, the potential for additional therapy is determined by what is found during the initial surgery and what is found uh, during the initial medical evaluation. And then, of course, what's uh, found as you go through surveillance. So it's, we call it dynamic risk stratification. So as you're going through care, the intensity can be increased or decreased. And sometimes there's options for treatment. And some of the treatments are similar to the initial treatment. And some of them are different. There's different options down the road, depending on what's found on the, based on the data. So I'm just going to walk through about five slides of what's typical and what should be expected as you um, access the healthcare system during the evaluation and treatment process. The first one, I think, is the one that we have the least control over and probably the most frustration with, and that's, of course, accessing healthcare. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I was in the military. One of the beautiful things about being on active duty is we didn't really have to work with insurance approvals and prior authorizations. Um, and since that time, I've now become a little bit more educated, but many of you who are listening are even more educated than I am in, on, this, on the challenges of accessing healthcare. So when you do though, think about the obstacles, make sure when you get prior authorizations that you get an authorization that includes a whole team. We have some patients that sometimes they can access an appointment with me, but then they don't have an authorization for the surgeon. That's typically not helpful if it's somebody whose nodule would you know, be diagnosed um, with surgery as part of the treatment plan. So access to the whole team is really important. Many of the places that you may be referred to, especially if it's a tertiary care center, can help provide letters of medical necessity, working with your local providers to hopefully increase the likelihood of getting prior authorization. But many of these things are out of our hands, um, but I think everyone that's attending uh, THICA and medical providers that are giving talks at THICA have all gone through this and are willing um, and very energized to help work with families um, uh, you know, access the best, best health care possible for each situation and each person. When you come in for your med initial medical evaluation, the first thing, of course, is confirming that there is a nodule. I see you know, many patients, even a couple of weeks, that they're referred for a nodule. And then when we review the ultrasound images, it's not really a nodule. It could just be irregularity associated with autoimmune thyroid disease, or it might be a cyst where further evaluation is not needed. It might just be surveillance. So the first is to confirm it, but also during that appointment, if you're fortunate and the person is comfortable, they should actually show you the images because that's part of the education process, which is what we have an obligation as physicians to provide is education. We're the education piece of the team for you. So the ultrasound should at least be looked at as far as the report and images if the person's comfortable, which is a first sign to say, how often does someone see a patient? Um, if they're comfortable looking at ultrasound images, then that gives you a clue that they should be a little bit more comfortable as far as the evaluation process. And I've built a team where they have more confidence uh, and the rest of the team having experience. Based on what the ultrasound shows, there's a fine needle aspiration biopsy. And prior to it, your provider should go through the potential results. It's not a yes, no process. There's up to six potential results. And that's part of our obligation again, is if you're having a procedure, you should know what the potential outcome of that procedure is. Once that is back, then there's an op There's another discussion of what to do with the results. Uh, some things, can, if they're biopsied and benign, can be surveilled. They don't need to have surgery. Then there's some that are clearly abnormal that would benefit from surgery. And then there's a gray zone. And all those types of discussions and education should be part of this initial medical evaluation process. I try to not only communicate to the parent, but also to the patient. And I think most of us as pediatricians do that, um, and that's critically important. So obviously, if it's a three or four-year-old, you're going to interact with the patient, but the complexity of the discussion will be much different than if it's a 13-year-old or a 16-year-old. So it, even things that are difficult to discuss are important to discuss. Um, and sometimes there is you know, moments of stress, anxiety, crying, even during the 
appointments, but that's an important part of the process of going through it. None of us enjoy that, but being truthful, honest, and open about all the data that we have, what we think is going on, and, and how to move forward is the right thing to do. So anticipatory guidance is another part of the initial medical evaluation that should be provided whether you're at a medical center or in the community. Peter just did a, a summary, nice summative job about surgery. Um, so we won't go through uh, you know, all those details, but you should talk about what options um, are for surgery, discuss potential complications, how often they are not just in general and published literature, but potentially even within that um, surgeon's practice or within the Institute and how many surgeons are involved in helping take care of patients uh, with thyroid disease that um, ultimately go to the operating room. Discuss what the potential results of surgery are, and that should be part of the medical discussion as well, um, and how that will be used to help guide further uh, treatment, whether it's radioactive iodine or additional surgery, uh, and then talk about who's going to do the post-operative surveillance. So patients that have a total thyroidectomy, at least 25% will have hypocalcemia, most of it hopefully is transient, but you should know before surgery who's getting those labs, who's following those labs, and, and what your access point is to make sure that there's communication after surgery as well. And then scar care is really important. That may be part of the initial discussion or may actually wait until the two-week or three-week follow-up, whatever the surgeon is, has as their typical uh, follow-up time frame where surgical care uh, is discussed, whether it's shown or a piece of paper uh, that's an important part of the initial surgical evaluation and or post-surgery. During the post-surgery appointment, at least in our practice, what we try to do is coordinate that. Um, so post-op medical care, we'll go over the, the pathology results, what the surgeon removed and what the pathologist found. And we use that information then to educate and decide if additional surveillance, additional treatment is needed like radioactive iodine, or if we can enter into surveillance. If we are considering radioactive iodine, again, it's an education, it's a discussion of potential risks and benefits, potential complications, how do we avoid those, anticipatory guidance of how, you, how and who you should contact if you're experiencing um, potential complications from radioactive iodine, from the nauseousness that can happen right at the initial ingestion to salivary gland swelling and pain. Uh, all those things should be discussed so you are walking into a treatment that you know the potential risks and the potential benefits. The other discussion to, uh, to consider is if it's an inpatient or outpatient. And some of that depends on local regulations. Some of it depends on travel. So we have some patients that travel um, and we can't, they have to stay in our hot room um, until they, the health physics folks give them clearance rather than send them to the hotel. So we try not to take patients and put them into public spaces after radioactive iodine therapy. Um, and those types of discussions are also critically important before the treatment uh, is initiated. And then finally, surveillance and subsequent treatment. How often do you have to see the provider? Can you get labs in between, but you're just communicating and not actually physically seeing them? And if that's true, what is that process for? Uh, how do you access that team so you can go over results without having to play phone tag? Many of the electronic health records now have built-in apps for your phone and you can communicate through, at least in, at our hospital, it's called My Chart, but then they make it cute and call it My Chop. But everyone has a My, whatever your, your health record uses, and that's a nice way of communicating with your team. And then also know when your appointments are, when you're supposed to get labs, when you're gonna get imaging, all those things should be part of the um, process. So if all these things are not happening in the community, um, where you potentially are accessing care, then you can help advocate to make sure some of these things happen. So having a list of what you should expect is really important. Um, so when you walk into your appointment, the first appointment, your follow-up appointment, or your help guiding other people going through this process, that you that people have a list of what they should expect from healthcare and what we have an op as an obligation to provide our patients. And ultimately, you know, we hope we don't need repeat surgery, repeat radioactive iodine or systemic therapy, but all these things are then of course, part of the discussion um, and anticipatory guidance which each, with each of those steps. So why are these details so important? Um, because as already been discussed, I think in a several other talks already today, we're fortunate in, in taking care of kids that have thyroid cancer because the outcome disease specific mortality is so low. So more than 99% of our patients will survive their disease. And so 
our goal, our obligation is to try to reduce complications. And most of the data we have has been published on surgical complications, but as I'll say in a, a couple of slides, but to Peter's benefit, because he's listening, um, it's medical complications as well. So it's the whole team that needs the experience, but unfortunately, I think most of the publications are directed more at surgical complications than medical complications. But this is a study, as you can see, published years ago is from insurance data. And this was looking at who's operating on our, on our kids as far as uh, endocrine surgery. And for thyroid surgery, it was a mix, and that still happens today. There are some adult surgeons that operate on adolescents at least, sometimes pediatric patients as well, younger children. Um, but the, you know, it was less than 20% that were actually high volume endocrine surgeons that were operating in our kids. So more than 80% of, of patients, pediatric patients that were undergoing thyroid surgery were having surgery that was performed um, by someone who wouldn't meet the criteria that's been published and since repeated in several other studies to show that it's around 25 or so a year where the risk really decreases as far as surgical complications. Other studies that came around that time kind of lent to the same conclusions. So the bar graph on the left looks at children's oncology groups. So these are non-tertiary care centers in yellow and then children or, and centers where there's children's oncology groups, which are more tertiary care hospitals. And again, there's more yellow than there is blue. And when you look at the bar graph uh, on the other side of this slide, you can see how many surgeries per year for each of these institutes, this wasn't even per surgeon, were being performed. Uh, and there was certainly institutes performing fewer than 20 surgeries a year than there were performing more than 23 surgeries a year. And from that, there was more, a couple of studies that came out as far as the risk of complications. And so the two biggest risks for surgical complications, the most common, of course, is hypoparathyroidism, where the parathyroid glands are damaged, the calcium drops. Transient is temporary, so that's very, actually fairly common, 10 to 30%, um, and you just need a good surveillance plan, as I mentioned earlier. And permanent was 12%, and we obviously want that number to be as low as possible. So it's you can treat hypoparathyroidism, but it's certainly much more complicated to treat hypoparathyroidism and hypothyroidism than just hypothyroidism uh, by itself. Recurrent laryngeal nerve damage was less common, but still more common at younger ages. And I still hear, and I just heard even two weeks ago um, and read through an op note where sometimes the surgeon still uses the description that a nerve was sacrificed because the tumor was invading it. And at least in our practice, and if there's time for questions, we can talk about it. I still don't, unless the nerve was knocked out by the tumor, um, we can treat minimal disease and not have to, um, hopefully not have surgeons sacrifice nerves. And so knowing about these types of things before, again, is really important to, to talk to the surgeon before surgery, as far as how, how extensive the tumor is invading, what the potential surgery is gonna be. Um, and what happens, you know, what, depending on what the surgeon finds in the operating room. So as I said a couple of slides ago, it's not just the surgeon, though. it's an experienced endocrinologist and team, because every hospital is a little different. Sometimes it's an oncologist, not an endocrinologist that runs the show. Sometimes it's a surgeon at Seattle Children's. Uh, the ENT group is really the gatekeepers of care for evaluating kids with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. So every center may have its own gatekeeper but there is a medical portion to it and a surgical portion to it. And the whole team's experience is really what's the most important, not any one person. And so as we have talked about before, um, when we wrote the guidelines in 2015, they were published in 2015, it took a couple of years before 2015 to get them to the publication state. Um, our goal was to write guidelines that were threefold, really reduce complications, surgical and medical, maintain low disease specific mortality, achieve remission, and then try to avoid an increase in recurrence. And so we suggested that nodules, if you have a nodule, there's data saying 25% risk of cancer. So there were still patients going to the operating room without a fine needle aspiration biopsy. So our guidelines try to alleviate that and say patients should have a biopsy because you can have, if it's 25% risk, it's still 75% that may not need surgery. Radioactive iodine, we felt that you know, low risk, highly effective therapy, but not all patients benefit from it. So we gave some recommendations on who you could select that may not benefit from radioactive iodine. And it, once you give a dose, how do you follow a patient to determine if you would benefit from more treatment with radioactive iodine? And then finally, I think what's been most important as far as 
trying to impact a community is regionalization of care. And again, this kind of focused on the surgeon because that was the data we have. But the goal was if we're gonna write guidelines, our goal is not just to write guidelines that are only gonna be at medical centers um, you know, in big cities, but guidelines that would help change the community and help change uh, access to care um, in each state, not just in several corners of the, of the United States. And so six years after the guidelines, there are more and more pediatric thyroid centers that are being advertised. And that's been very rewarding. So this is over six months ago, I just went to Google and chopped, you know, typed in pediatric thyroid centers. And the nice thing is this means that each of those hospitals is at least a, organizing a care team. So it may not be in every state, but it's in more and more states. And I'll keep clicking through and you can see in many of these centers, I've spoken to the people there and helped set it up or Jonathan, who was on the call, I don't know if he's still on the call, may have spoke to them. So we're all, as people have been more involved in taking care of kids with thyroid cancer over the years, also trying to mentor and help other centers stand up so that patients have greater access without having to travel and fight insurance companies as frequently um, as still is the case today. And then here's just a couple more. So they're everywhere. Um, not everywhere that they need to be, but they're more places than they used to be. So how do you build the best system? So we need access to care. That's absolutely not just making it through the insurance you know, craziness, but also how do you interact with your team and how do you back and forth? And I couldn't exist without my nurse, uh, Lindsay, and my nurse practitioner, Stephanie. Um, they really are providing the best access to care. Uh, for our patients. How, what do you have to build for the evaluation portion of it, the treatment portion, the treatment portion of it, the surveillance portion of it? How do you transition patients from pediatrics to adults, which many of us as pediatricians don't like doing because we like our patients. But at some point, uh, all of us need to figure out how to transition patients. And I think we need to do a better job of doing that as well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, research to help improve all these things, not just scientific research. You've already heard some talks on the genomics, the genomic landscape of thyroid cancer, but also access to care, as Jonathan's published a couple papers, um, quality of life surveys, all the things that are important to have a, a, a complete healthcare system for our patients with thyroid disease. This is how it's set up at CHOP. I set this up 11 years ago, and every institute just has to figure out how to set it up themselves. So prior to setting it up at CHOP, patients would sometimes go to surgery and then come to endocrinology when sometimes it was pediatric surgery, sometimes it was ENT, sometimes it was endocrine. And the way we've done it now is it doesn't matter how you access the healthcare system at CHOP, everyone gets rooted through the thyroid center. So they get through, through the same consistent evaluation. So having a single centralized access point, again, helps improve care. It helps them decrease the time, anxiety, and frustration for families to access the healthcare system. The gatekeeper at, at CHOP is myself, and then I have a person I work with, Dr. Mustafi, who's dual boarded in endocrine and oncology. We do the preoperative ultrasound. We have point of care ultrasound, but again, this is just one example. It can be done diagnostic ultrasound. We figure out what the preoperative staging is, and then we let the surgeon know. The surgeon does their own evaluation. If it came from general surgery, who's Dr. Adzik in our case, or ENT, which is Dr. Kazahaya, that's who it goes back to. And then we have, you know, the whole follow-up plan and every patient, doesn't matter how they come through, if it's through the ER, if it's through a clinic, a referral goes through the same process. And I think that's been very helpful for us to learn um, how to do a better job uh, and also hopefully for our patients, how to access care. But this is what we try to help other centers set up. As Jonathan mentioned in his talk um, earlier, we've also set up a, a consortium now. It's just starting. Um, there's five centers, as you can see. So I'm the lead person in, at, at CHOP and uh, my program manager is Amber, Stephen Waggespack at MD Anderson, Jonathan at Sick Kids, Catherine Denauer and Emily, uh, Christensen Legay at Yale and Ari Wassner at Boston. So these are the five initials, but we have more than 20 institutes as you saw on that other slide, other centers that are standing up that we hope to bring on board as well. Again, trying to improve care in the community, not just at each of our centers. We're also working, as Peter mentioned, on the second version of the guidelines. Our timeframe is hopefully less than five years. Um, but what we wanna do is provide a little bit more clarity. I think they've been very helpful guidelines, uh, even writing them, you know, all of us learn something. 
and now even working on the second one, it's really encouraged more papers to be um, published and more areas to be explored. And I think the second version of the guidelines, which I'm hoping will be released by the end of next year, middle to end of next year, um, will provide another step forward in how we're working to improve care in our communities and at our medical centers for our kids with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. And so this is a busy slide, but it's kind of what I always keep in mind as we're trying to build these things. We don't want ivory tower medicine. We don't want things that can only be accomplished at medical centers, but there always will be some sub sub specialized, highly specific specialized things that can only be done at centers that have greater resources. But the goal is to write guidelines that kind of cover both. There's a higher, you know, if you have high re incidence, high resources, that's excellent. You can do stratification of care, surgical, medical, individualized therapy. But if you're someplace that doesn't have a high incidence and there's not as many resources, that there's still some guidance to ensure that we can decrease complications and patients are informed and they're part of the process. And we write guidelines that kind of cover both sides of the spectrum. But knowing that if things don't make sense to you, knowing what is supposed to happen as a patient, you advocate for yourselves and help mentor other people to advocate for themselves helps us all improve this process. We know there's a lot of work to do, a lot of work ahead. These are just three articles that were published this year. These are all, all based on adults. Um, so it's not that the health system is not aware of the obstacles to care. Um, all of us are aware. And then a recent one from pediatrics um, specifically highlighting social determinants of healthcare and how decreased access to healthcare, and it was actually kind of amplified last year with COVID, is patients oftentimes present with disease that's further along because they don't access, access the healthcare system as early as possible. So we're all working this way, but your feedback to us is what helps us move things forward. So to close things out, I just want to have a couple of slides that say being informed is really critical and asking to be informed and asking to be educated by your providers, our obligation. Be an advocate for your son, your daughter, your family member, and then when possible, be a mentor for other people that are going through this process. There are social groups that you can join. Um, there are patient you know, um, organizations and Thyka is really just an awesome prime example of that where you can get involved and help other people. There are centers of excellence. So. It, this thyroid centers, you know, it's like the world's best coffee. You can put a placard on your door and say it's the world's best coffee. You can say it's the world's best, best thyroid center. Um, but just be aware that there are really no centers of excellence that are defined for adult or pediatric thyroid cancer. There are some for breast cancer, other cancers. The P10 Foundation has done actually a nice job. So they actually now have a 12 page application. So how, how you can become a P10 center of excellence which CHOP just recently did in the last year. Um, and it really outlines what the obligation is to be able to put that on your wall, saying you're a center of excellence. And you can see it's patient focused. So how does the patient access? How do they navigate? How do we get back to them? And you have to prove all these things. And then there has to be certain specialists that are part of the requirement to call them uh, yourself a P10 center of excellence. And these are the required list of, of medical providers. And these are the optional ones. And you go through the process and the P10 Foundation has helped and hopefully will help improve the care that patients with P10 hematoma tumor syndrome have to access care. So the same could be done in thyroid. I think it would be important. I've been saying it for years, um, but politics are always something that people fear and get in the way. Um, but patients are the, the people we need to be serving and you're at the focus of our efforts. So again, patient pressure helps ensure that increasing quality of care and increasing access to quality care. So optimization of care is really important. I won't belabor this slide, but just reducing complications. And there should be a gatekeeper, a master of ceremonies, whoever it is, it can be the surgeon, it can be the endocrinologist, it can be an oncologist, so somebody that's helped steering the boat, steering the path to evaluation and care, even if there's eight or 10 other providers that are part of that process of the, of the evaluation and management. So don't be or do be organized, but don't be shy. Um, ask questions, and then sometimes, and we still see this happen. I've weekly are con I'm consulting and trying to help take care of patients at other centers that I may never see 
And so I work with, and Jonathan works with, and I'm sure Peter does the same even in his practice with other providers where families can't come to Chicago or Toronto or Philadelphia, um, but their providers can contact us and we can help guide and provide at least opinion on what we think the right next step is. So if you're in one of those situations, ask your, your provider, your local provider, if they've talked to or if they can talk to somebody who's more expert or more experienced within this, within this field. And then the last is just, you have time. This is a slow process, um, thankfully, thyroid cancer, which sometimes is, most of the time is a benefit. Sometimes it's frustrating how prolonged it takes to figure out if the cancer is gone and still having cancer that sometimes isn't completely gone because it's such a slow process. So you have time to ensure that your son or daughter is getting the best care available and just please take the time. You should never feel pressure that you have to have surgery tomorrow. You should take the time to make sure that you're going to the right surgeon and they're doing the right surgery. You're going to the right endocrinologist and they know how to read an ultrasound and the person doing the biopsy knows how to read the slides and everything is falling into place without you feeling pressured. Take the time to make sure you get the best care available. And with that, I will end. And I think we have at least six plus minutes, hopefully to, to field some questions and then whatever we don't field here, as I mentioned at four, there's another uh, question session if anyone's interested in joining us. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Bauer and Dr. Angelos. Great information to have. Um, we do have a few questions here in the Q&A. Um, the first one asks about the management of pulmonary metastasis. Um, and then it says not iodine uptake. So non-avid pulmonary metastasis? I think that's what they right. mean because it's not taking up iodine, yep. So it's a, a great question and an area, actually one of the most exciting areas um, that we're beginning to venture into. Um, so there are, it depends on the degree of pulmonary metastasis. There's some patients that have minimal, well, in pediatrics, almost everybody has diffuse micronodular disease, which means they have two or three millimeter metastasis. Um, rather than big, larger lesions. Um, but it depends on how much and how big um, the burden is. So some patients we just surveil, and we usually do that with chest CTs every six to 12 months, just to see if it's changing. So if it's a small amount and it's not changing, we might just continue to follow. But if it's someone who has a higher burden of disease, um, and especially if the disease is actually changing, it's growing, they're getting, there's more of them, they're getting bigger. Um, there's now evidence, mostly in adults, but some preliminary evidence in pediatrics of using certain drugs that can help sensitize or resensitize those lesions to radioactive iodine. In pediatrics, as was mentioned again by um, Amy Franco earlier, just looking at the differences between adults and pediatrics, their most common um, change in the DNA in the cells of the with cancers in lungs for pediatrics are oncogenic fusions. So the RET fusions and TRAC fusions are the most common. And there are really a couple excellent drugs now um, that can help decrease those, even without radioactive iodine can cause regression. And we don't have enough information yet, but sometimes even um, we, we don't know yet if they can cause complete response. But also some early data to say, if you use them for a period of time, then give radioactive iodine. If they didn't absorb it, then they might that tumor might reabsorb it. And that was first shown in adult tumors that were BRAF positive. Mm -hmm. And so the MEK and BRAF inhibitors have been used in, in adults to resensitize distant metastasis that can't be surgically removed. Um, so if that's the case, if it's progressing, finding a center that's excellent. Um, some of these things are still under uh, research protocols. Um, so in the adult world, there's a number of centers that run adult protocols with thyroid oncologists that help uh, manage patients like that. And then it, there's several pediatric hospitals that we have the same. And I work with Ted Leach, and we have a number of patients, almost 10 patients now in systemic therapy. I know Jonathan has a couple as well. So the, that's the, the long answer to a complicated question. Um, but it's an exciting time because we have way more options than we used to have even five years ago. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. The next question, do some pac patients have to have ultrasounds for every follow-up for the rest of their lives, or it is, is it not recommended to patients 
once their thyroid seems to be at a correct level. So it sounds like, do, do they need long-term follow-up ultrasounds? Peter, do you want to answer? We can both answer, but. <laughs> yeah, so, so you know, I, 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 let me give you my perspective and then I'll, I'll certainly defer to uh, Dr. Bauer because, um, you know, I, I, as a surgeon, I would say, I think it's important for um, thyroid cancer patients to have long-term follow-up. And I do believe that an ultrasound on a regular basis is going to be critical. Now, exactly what is the appropriate time frame and interval for ultrasounds? You know, maybe that's something where uh, maybe that changes over time, but but I think it's really important. And I and I would tell patients, you know, I think the great thing about papillary thyroid cancer is that most patients live a long time. The downside is that means they need to be followed for a very long time. But Andy, what do you think? I, I agree. Um, it's somewhat addictive. Um, and we've heard actually, I think Jonathan brought it up in the predisposition talk that he gave. Some people, some of our patients come in and the ultrasound reassures them. And sometimes when they're coming in, they're gonna get an ultrasound. It gives them anxiety until they get the results of the, the ultrasound. So it's a balance between how invasive the disease was when it presented, mm -hmm. what the data shows in surveillance, like the thyroid globulin, anti-thyroid globulin, and at least some close surveilled ultrasounds. And that's usually every six months for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then just the, does the ultrasound stress people out or does it make them feel better? Um, and I use all those things to kind of come up with a plan. And if patients are doing well, it's decreasing frequency, as Peter said. So it's usually every six months, and then we'll get to once a year, and then we might even start skipping years if the patient data looks good, and skipping a year doesn't drive everybody a little insane. But I try to tell people we can't, we may not need to do the ultrasound every year for the rest of your life. We do need labs at least once a year, which includes a TSH to make sure that that's, you're on the right dose and taking the medicine and it's being absorbed. And then on top of that, your TG, anti-TG, that's forever, or calcitonin if you're a MEN2 patient. Mm -hmm. And then the radiology is, you know, as, as both of us have said, it's part, absolutely part of it. Um, it just depends on the frequencies, sometimes individualized. Okay. And it's 2.30, but we have one more question maybe we can get to before we're done. Um, how is the communication between pediatric and adult centers for transfer of care, for example, from Seattle Children's to SCCA? Should pa parents assume communication is happening as our children begin to turn 18 and 19? <laughs> Andy, Andy, you know, I, I guess I would say my, my impression is that you should never assume that communication is happening. Mm -hmm. um, but Andy, you know, you have more experience in this area than I. Yeah. Uh, first, I'll say that I'm terrible at transitions because I, I have 25 year olds and I, I didn't start when they were 25. <laughs> <laughs> My nurses remind me all the time, but um, you know, they started 15 and you know, all of a sudden they're a nurse in our own Institute and I'm still seeing them, but we try not to, we try to transition and the patient should not assume. And again, it depends on where they're transitioning to. So sometimes if they're doing exceptionally well, it can just be a local endocrinologist you know, and that's what we recommend. And I certainly don't know every adult endocrinologist, but sometimes we'll go to Google Maps and clinic and try to find somebody and at least give them a phone number um, at that time. But if it's someone who's under active care and they're losing care, so there are some centers where at 18, they are transferred. Sometimes that's the healthcare system. Sometimes it's the particular institute. Um, at CHOP, we can see patients after 18 in, in endocrinology. But if and when that happens, then there should be direct communication and the person who's being transitioned should have a name and a phone number. Mm -hmm. And so that helps decrease the assumption that it's happening. But as Peter mentioned, you know, it, you shouldn't assume it's happening. You should mm -hmm. ask for the name, ask for the number and try to arrange that the transition happens. Again, I, I think one of the nice things in electronic health record, at least Epic is what we use, mm -hmm. is now there's this care everywhere function, mm -hmm. which even if I can't, I'm not credentialed at our adult hospital, but our adult hospital can see the notes at CHOP. So not just the transition with the name and number, but make sure you have the information with you. And some of the healthcare systems communicate and some don't. So sometimes you have to do the old school, get a CD of whatever mm -hmm. <laughs> previous notes or printouts. Um, 
or the release, release of information act, but sometimes it's now built into our EHRs, so. Okay, well, thank you. Looks like our time is up. Um, thanks again for everything, for your time, for your presentations and for everything you do for Thyka and to help us as patients too. We greatly appreciate it. So thank you again. Thanks for everyone. It was great to thank see you, you too, Peter. Bye. All right, take care. Bye.